I remember Carrie Fisher yeah. uh, bowed down to you. She was yeah. so impressed by the short that you had done. I have a signed autograph in my in my office from her that says to my favorite director, Zach. <laughs> Zach, thank you for coming. Um, the Canadian Film Salon is dedicated to supporting um, Canadian and in particular, uh, in our case, BC and Vancouver filmmakers. And you're going to be such a great inspiration. Well, for it's a huge honour to be here, so thank you. Yeah. You went on to uh, be a producer and director for Sci-Fi, Legendary, mm -hmm. Disney, Lionsgate, yep. and uh, your first theatrical feature, Freaks. We're talking about that tonight. Uh, you co-wrote and directed that with uh, Adam Stein, and uh, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the birth of it and uh, how you wrote it and why you wrote it in a certain way. Yeah. You mentioned a resource list. Uh, you made a <laughs> list of things you could get for free or cheap, is that right? Well, we basically, Adam and I were both filmmakers directing our own stuff and had had just so many projects fall apart. Uh, everything we had tried to get going didn't for years and years and years um, for a bunch of reasons. Some, you know, when you start out, you often write scripts that are way more expensive than, than you can make. Like you write a $50 million movie, even though you don't have $50 million. Or, and then you're like, okay, 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 I'll write a $10 million movie. But you still don't have $10 million. <laughs> and so those movies end up not happening. And sometimes you find other people's scripts that seem like they're happening or they're not happening, but you like them and you try and get them going because those people have money. And then it just still never happens because to get for the money to be spent, you need an actor, and to get an actor, it's almost impossible. But then you get the actor, but but then you get them, the money's gone, and it's just like always this catch twenty two. So, w what's in that ten million dollar script that you can't make, <laughs> that you well, can't afford? Like what, like explosions, yeah, like planes, sc scale is a big thing. Uh, visual effects is a big thing. You know, scenes with tons of people in them. Um, scenes with tons of different locations all around the world, you know, like things that cost actual money. And then one of the, one of the big things is as generally as movies have bigger scale, um, they also need bigger actors, which also come with bigger price tags. So it sort of gets bigger and bigger on its own, um, which is why you see a lot of, of indie movies are just sort of people in a house talking and stuff like that, because it has just a few people in a house and that's usually something people can afford. But we saw this speech by Mark Duplass, who's a very famous director of the Duplass Brothers. And it's a very famous speech now um, that he gave at South by Southwest. Um, and it's called The Cavalry's Not Coming. And he basically laid out this career plan for anyone, you know, a 10-step plan to how, to how to be a successful filmmaker. And his first step makes so much sense, even though no one ever does it, which is just write down what you have <laughs> and then make a movie with that stuff. You have a library. Yeah. You've got all the equipment in the library. Yes. Uh, you've got all the people in the library, green right? Screen. You've got a green screen. So, yeah. and it makes so much sense. When you're starting out, don't write a movie you can't make. Yeah. Write a movie that you can make with the stuff that you have. His first movie was about, about a puffy chair and a van and his brother because he had a puffy chair, a van, and his brother, and they went to Sundance with that film. And, and the so, film was called Puffy Chair. <laughs> so basically, Adam and I went on this long walk and we said, you know what? We've just got to make a movie no matter what that we can make no matter what. Yeah. And it has to be something that fits that scale. So we wrote down all the things that we had. At the time, it was the two of us, a house, um, Adam's son, who was five at the time, and his family owned a restaurant, uh, Cantor's Deli, which is one of the most famous delis in, in L.A. So we said, okay, it's a movie about a deli, a house, two guys, and a kid. If we wrote a script with those elements, we could greenlight it just ourselves because Adam had a camera and had a house and everything. So we basically um, set out to write that script. Now, as we were writing it and as we started working on it and showing it to people, people we had met along the way, we'd been you know, trying to be filmmakers for many years and made stuff before. As we worked on it, people started coming forward and saying, oh, you're making a movie? Actually, I'll give you a little bit of money. And someone else said, oh, I'll give you a little bit of money. And it just sort of, then we put some of our own money in and it got a little bit bigger. Um, but and did, you, did you have a date in mind? You said, we're gonna start shooting on this day. Not, an, not initially, we just said, okay, let's write a script that we can make. And then as we started working on it, we were like, I think we could actually make this just with us. Um, we, the script was getting pretty good. And then we got an opportunity, as sometimes happens in life, that got sidetracked us to go make a TV show. And it meant not making our movie right away, 
which we reluctantly did because it was such a great opportunity to direct this TV show and make many episodes. And we ended up doing two seasons of that show. That's the Disney show. Disney show called Mech X4. Ah. We met so many people, vendors and technicians and all sorts of people that the whole time we, we were saying, hey, also, we're making this movie. And our plan was, because um, they shot season one and two back to back, was to shoot Freaks between season two and three. And so we launched, and that's when we said, okay, we're shooting it this summer between these seasons because we have the whole film stars a kid. So we're, and if you film in the summer with a kid, they don't have to go to school, so you get more time to film with them. Tougher to get crew, though. Way tougher to get crew and yeah. way tougher to get favors because the town is super busy. Right. But it was our only choice because the kid's in every scene of the movie of yeah. the film. And so we kind of launched, we said, we're making the movie by this date. And we started kind of fundraising. And the cool thing is we could say, okay, if we have a hundred grand, great, we're making the movie for a hundred grand. Oh, we've got a little bit more. Now we're at 400 grand. Great. We're making the movie for 400 grand. Cause we were the ones, every, all the money that came in, we said, this may be all the money we ever get. And if so, that's the movie we're making and you have no creative control. <laughs> and a few people said yes to that. And then because we had put a bunch of our own money in, you know, they felt like we had skin in the game. And, then, and would you say that's hard and fast rule? Like no one else is going to invest unless you're also... It's not hard and fast because sometimes you don't have money. But, <laughs> right. um, but it definitely helps because they think, well, you're invested. You're going to try and make sure you get that investment back. Right. Um, you know, we didn't tell them, but Adam and I were fully ready to never see that money again. We were just putting it in because it was buying a ticket to make our dream come true. So we didn't care if we ever got that money back. Okay. But of course, as other people put money in, uh, the responsibility of that starts to weigh on you because you now have other people have literally just written a check because of a script you wrote, yeah. like an idea you had and they believe in it and they're giving you money. And one of the first things we did with that money was hire a casting director to see if we could, you know, the original plan was for us to star in it, but we thought, hey, let's see if we can get actors, who knows? Um, and when we had wrote, written the script, we'd got some advice, which was when you make offers to actors, you won't have any money. You won't have enough money to buy them. The only thing you'll be able to do is pay the absolute minimum. And so the thing that's going to convince them isn't the money. It's that you've written incredibly interesting characters. The one thing you can do for free is write characters that any actor would want to play. And so the first actor we got was Bruce Dern, who's a two-time Oscar nominee, and ended up playing the role I was supposed to play. <laughs> so, uh, And once we got him... Was, do you think he did a better job? Than definitely did a better job than me. Um, did he bring his own ice cream truck? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome, well, right? Funny thing, you should mention the ice cream truck the show never had a season three. They canceled the show. And so immediately we went, so what are you doing with all the stuff? Because <laughs> there was two seasons of props and sets and wardrobe and, and everything you could imagine of a well-funded Disney television show. So we went to this warehouse, this 100,000 square foot warehouse in, in Langley, uh, which is near Vancouver. Opened it like the Ark of the Covenant you know, <laughs> warehouse with no lights are on or anything. We went there with flashlights and basically took everything we, we could for freaks. And one of the things was there was a food truck in Mech X4, the TV show, and we just repainted it to become the ice cream truck. Yeah. So we, we just spent a whole day loading everything we could into the one truck we could afford to rent. So suddenly your, your resource list gets longer and well, longer. Well, that's the thing is yeah. like all the visual effects in the movie, most of them I did, but some of the really big ones were done by the big visual effects houses that worked on Mech X4 and they did it for free because they always wish they had been filmmakers that had followed their dream and right. also just wanted to help out the guy who had just given them, you know, two seasons worth of television visual effects. And, and so the interesting thing was, because just often as an artist, you're always forced with this choice of like doing your doing your craft or selling out and doing something for the man that's kind of always your your debate and i have a lot of friends that have done one or the other they've kind of only ever done their craft and sort of struggled gotten a few things made but always can barely afford dinner and then you've got people that only ever work for the man and have can have houses with families in them but are empty inside and so i've found this great success all the way through my career of kind of ping-ponging back and forth because they each help each other. Yeah. On the, the stuff you're doing for the man, they respect and often give you more control because of the artistic stuff you did by yourself. And the artistic stuff you're doing by yourself always benefits from all the resources and contacts you meet uh, when you're doing the stuff, the bigger budget stuff like we did for Disney. And if you've got that fire in your belly, as Bernard Herzog <laughs> says, yeah. like you want to have start with a fire in your belly and then transfer that fire to someone <laughs> else's belly. Exactly. Right? Because, yeah, they will, they, they see you living their, you, the, you, they see you living their dream. Exactly. As you live your dream. Yeah, so we ended up making the movie um, for a lot more than nothing and with a lot more incredible actors than just us. You know, we had Emile Hirsch play the role that Adam was supposed to play, who's an incredible actor. 
Um, and we had people like Amanda Crew and Grace Park, who are really famous people from from Vancouver, and um, and this incredible little girl uh, who basically just steals the show, Amazing. and and uh, you know made a movie, and then we were lucky to get it out there. So. Tell me about that micro, micro budget draft. Like, how were you going to pull off the gunfights and the explosions? Like, were you going to get yeah. it off camera and people react to it? So, like, yeah, there was, wind, there was a lot of hearing of things because right. you can, visual, sound effects are very cheap. <laughs> Honestly, the script was very similar to the, you know, the, the, the one that got made compared to the one that we were going to make for nothing. The main thing that changed is just the house it was in was much nicer. Mm. The actors that were in it were way better. The lighting right. was looked way cooler. Yeah. <laughs> the crew got fed. You know, actually everyone got paid to make it. You know, like all yeah. those types of differences. That's really the difference. Can you talk about the the favors that you called in and begged in? Because you ended up producing the film as yeah. well as directing. Yeah, I mean, Adam and I had been directors and and had been trying to be directors for 15 years before we made this film. So. There was 15 years of favors we had done for other people, and 15 yeah. years of favors that we called in on this one. Um, so you volunteered in other people's yeah. films on weekends, and that gets paid back. Definitely, yeah. and uh, helped them out with you know because I I've done every job other than directing, lots of editing, and I held the boom and did craft service, and you know helped everyone as I was coming up and learning, and also um, we had met a lot of producers. Uh, we uh, tried to get big-time producers to come on board and help us make the film, but everyone's like, you're making a movie for like nothing? No thanks, because they know how much hard work it is. <laughs> um, so Adam, Adam and I ended up producing it as well, and the approach we took, which worked fairly well, is literally starting every, every conversation with, hi, we're producing this, but we don't know anything about whatever this conversation is about. <laughs> and then they people would, love to teach you? Yeah. When you're open about your incompetence, then they <laughs> then they see it as like yeah. as charming rather than you just pretending like you know what you're doing and screwing it up. And people are hating you for it. Right. Yeah. And we also had this kind of league of of extraordinary producers that we would call upon. We kind of had six or seven of them, and we'd kind of rotate through each day. So we'd call one, then the next, then the next, then the next, and by the next week we'd be back around to the beginning with whatever question of like, so how do we do payroll? How do we, what do we need to ask our lawyer to make sure that they get? And like, So for, for emerging first time feature filmmakers that are listening to this or watching this, should, uh, would you recommend that they, they produce no matter what? No, I mean, if you can find someone who's done it before, that's always way better. Um, obviously having awareness of producing is very helpful because um, you know, you're always going to be the person who cares the most about your film. Um, and it's really helpful. There's a lot of times where knowing how producing works can uh, be really good at problem solving when things go wrong, because they always do. Um, but would your, but your in our case, it was the only choice, so we did it. And it was great that we did it, because we always pushed way harder than any other producer would have ever, because there was no, we didn't get paid to write or direct or produce the movie. It was all just you know, we did in the end once we sold the film, but there was five years of work before that. What so, do you mean push harder? Well, just like when it's your thing, there's always a point where it's okay or good enough where most people who've been working for too many hours for no money would just be like, we're, we're good, we got it, yeah. or it's good enough, or, <laughs> or, you know, this location's fine, or, you know, we don't need to, you know, spend on spend money on that or, or whatever. And when you're the producer, you can say, no, this is really important. We have to take money out of something else to pay for this because this is so critical. Or, yeah. no, I'm gonna keep scouting, you know, <laughs> for the best location, even though, like the house in the film, which is almost a major character of the film. Yeah. We found five days before we started shooting. Is it on the same street in the in No, the not at all. I yeah. <laughs> very cool. Can I ask yeah. where it was? Yeah, it was in Shaughnessy. And so that was one of the, f it was just, because we needed a giant house. Most of the movie takes place in this house. And shooting in Shaughnessy is great because there's these beautiful houses, but terrible because they don't let anyone shoot there. <laughs> because right. the houses are really nice and the neighbors don't like being bothered and they all know important people. Um, and we started to think about getting a permit, but this location manager who was helping us, we didn't have a location manager, but she was helping us, kind of said, you'll never get one. Um, only like, you know, Superman comes in and gets a permit. And <laughs> Literally Superman. <laughs> yeah, or X-Men <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and so, but, she's, but we realized if we kept everything we had to the property of the house, that you don't need a permit, because you don't need a permit to shoot on your own property, basically. Right. And so all we were such a small film that all of, and the 
house had a big enough backyard that all of our trucks, like Lego bricks, completely fit <laughs> onto the backyard. And so we basically had this mini little movie lot, and we told all the actors and all the crew and everyone to just park like five blocks away and walk. So, there's plenty of free parking. Right. Yeah. So everyone just walked in, and so there was no one blocking the driveways of you know neighbors. And then the most important thing is we had a PA, locations PA, just stand out front all day, and as anyone walked by, you know, with their dog sort of looking over the fence, just being like, hey, how's it going? Here's a treat for your dog. Like, oh, yeah, we're making a movie. Like, and just being really nice to all the people nice. that walked by so that they never complained. And we shot their... Uh, so good tip. Keep for, it contained. For weeks. Don't yeah. be a dick. Yeah. yeah. And uh, have dog treats. And uh, <laughs> by doing that, we, we ended up, you know, not getting a location that we couldn't get a permit for. And that way you, you avoid the, the stories of uh, people with leaf blowers trying to get paid off to yep. leave. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. And now you did have a shot, though, where you were out in the street and you're seeing a gunfight yeah, in so that's the middle all, of the street. Yeah, so that's all another neighborhood um, okay. in Richmond where we, um, it's an incredibly, I mean, the whole film was down, every decision and every accomplishment was down to a wire where it was very likely it was going to completely blow up in our face. And the house, finding it a few days beforehand is an example. But finding the street that we found was amazing because it was perfect. It had everything we needed. It had this idyllic house across from this house that was totally overgrown and looked like it was hidden, which is exactly what the script needed, and this lawn that had just been left to overgrow yeah. and, and this creepy gate, everything you could ever dream, dream of. And it was all good. We had a permit as long as we shot during the day. And then, but the movie, the whole end of the movie is set at night. And we just realized, oh, we're not going to get a permit for night, so I guess we're just, it's just not going to happen. And so we just started, started shooting the movie, but all the exterior night stuff was at the end. And Emil Hirsch, on the second day, he realized, he heard that we weren't shooting night for the end, that we were going to shoot it all day. And he took us aside and he was like, guys, do you want to be a day movie or do you want to be a night movie? <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, you know what? He's like, you wrote it as night, like with the fire and the cops and the lights. Like, it's, it's, an, it's a night movie, man. And we were like, you know, you're right, but we just... We'd have to paper the whole town, and we just realized we've got to do it as another example. So yeah. me and Adam and our one of our um, co-producers literally walked, because one of the things you have to do when you, when you get a night permit is, like, ask every person in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so we, for two weekends in the middle of the scorching summer, went to every house in this whole neighborhood, putting flyers out, trying to get permissions from the people that were home, getting as many signatures as we could, and then... But we were filming the interior stuff while we were waiting to find out. And we were coming up to the point where the interior stuff would either have to be day or night. And we were literally, our co-producer was in the permit office at Richmond like, Film Commission as we were blocking the scene <laughs> like with it lit for day, but, but blacks ready to drop outside the house to tent it off if needed because we would planned for either contingency. And we're literally like finishing the blocking, and my phone rings, and she says, "You got night." Can I we said, take a step okay. back to uh, pitching this project? Because uh, yeah, yeah, you wrote it and rewrote and rewrote and worked very hard. You put yeah. your own sweat in that <laughs> script, making sure it's something that, that actors are going to love. But how do you how do you pitch it to people? How do you get it to the money people and the the talent yeah. when uh, you know people do have that wall up between them and assistants? Well, most of the first investors were very close friends or family of ours, people that had believed, basically would have given us money no matter what it was. So that was helpful because then we had already some money on the table. So then we went, because no one wants to be the biggest sucker. Mm. No one wants to be the biggest investor. And they definitely don't want to be the first investor. Right. And so already having sort of Adam and I and one of my oldest friends and, one of, and Adam's uncle who was one of the other investors, the four of us already had a big chunk of change on the table. Right. And so then it was a lot easier to talk to people. And we had this script, and like you said, we had worked for years iterating it, where we had done um, table reads with actors and, and audiences over and over and over again, continuously um, improving and changing the script to try and make sure that it, it was as good as possible, not just sending it to one person at a time, but doing it with audiences. And that meant that when people read it, we knew that they would really like it. And so that was a big, it wasn't just us thinking it was good, as we had tested it. Mm. Um, and then, so then, Unlike most times where we're trying to get movies, we do have to do a huge amount of pitching and, pre and presenting and stuff. In this case, we basically just had a little lookbook, the script itself, 
and a little kind of investment package that talked about sort of the investment opportunity <laughs> uh, of sort of how much we're raising, how much we already had, what the return on investment was theoretically going to be, and how the structure of the investment worked. Um, and pretty much that is what did it for people. Um, there wasn't either they were in or out because we were very clear with our rules. It was you're in for the money, you have no creative control, you probably will never see your money again. And the thing you realize is most people that invest in films at that stage or that level, they're people that can afford to lose the money. Like for them, it's you know it's not a large amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, that those are the people that should be investing in film because it's such a high risk investment. What they were investing in wasn't a business opportunity. What they were investing in was actually the experience of making a movie. All the people that invested were buying a ticket on the filmmaking cruise. Come to set and be part of selling it and like all the decisions and that's what um, they really enjoyed. And so all along the way we tried to really make them all feel included because that was the party yeah, to just because that's and... it's it's that's the experience they're buying basically. Right. If they make their money back, great. But yeah. they're ready to lose it. And so and they're not going to get that if they're investing in whatever. Yeah, mutual funds. Stuff. Yeah, so for them it was exciting. People that had always loved movies but had never been involved in it. This is good. All right. Good. Yeah. Uh, do you have any uh, any don'ts that you can share for someone like me or a filmmaker who's uh, people to avoid perhaps or types yeah. of situations to avoid? I mean, I think the biggest don't is to put yourself in a situation where you can't make the movie. So mm -hmm. you can do that in a lot of ways by, like I said, writing a movie you can't afford or writing a movie that requires something you don't have, or um, putting yourself in a situation where you're sort of always waiting for something that you don't have, like, oh, well, I'll, you, you, you and I know so many people and who call themselves filmmakers, but they never actually make anything, because they're always sort of working on it, but never actually taking the steps to put it out there and say that they're actually doing it. So kind of not having a date in mind is dangerous, because then you're just sort of on no timeline. Um, in our case, Ours was kind of set by the age of the girl. It was the lead. We had to shoot in the summer. So that sort of gave us a deadline. But yeah. um, giving yourself some sort of deadline can be really helpful. And a, that's real, not just a fake one in your imagination, but something you actually have to deliver by. Um, and sort of, yeah, basically not taking from often, it was very rare in our case, but often you do have to take money that comes with a catch. Like someone will say, I'll give you, and it actually happened to us right before we started shooting, a company offered us 300 grand on the condition that we used that 300 grand to make offers to really famous actors. So basically the actor would get that 300 grand. Um, but this was like three weeks before we started shooting and we knew that that process takes months. Right. Like it takes three weeks just to send it and not hear back. <laughs> you, were, you were already cast. You well, yeah, we had basically had every because we had done this process where we had basically local Canadians that we had cast, and then, um, but the dad role was still up up in the air because Emil Hirsch didn't come on board till five days before we started shooting. No, yeah, well. but we had um, local actors kind of on standby who were told we're still <laughs> making offers to movie stars that might show up and might yeah. not, um, and so we, but we knew that this company was saying. It's what they were saying was going to take months, and we knew we were shooting in three weeks, and we had to. So we ended up saying no because we basically said, "We're shooting this movie; like we can't yeah. put it on pause because of that." Um, and then we ended up finding an actor anyway, who um, through another connection, someone knew Emil Hirsch's dad, and um, that just happened to fit our timeline. And he showed up a few days after he read the script. Which Did was you, pretty crazy. Uh, yeah, Dean Haglin? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the X Files. He, yeah. I once asked him how to make it in LA. He says, "Well, you got to drive around with your script, <laughs> throw it into passing convertible." <laughs> <laughs> that That's a great <laughs> idea. Yeah, yeah, I haven't done that. Dress up like UP, UPS, UPS driver and right. uh, deliver to people's doors. But I don't know. That's very creative. Friend, friend of a friend is how you Yeah, I mean, the best way to get actors. It's almost impossible to get actors through the traditional way, which is to have a casting director write a letter that says they're. They're who you always dreamed of, and write that for every actor you can imagine, and then send it to every actor with the peanuts that you can offer them. The vast majority of actors never even get get it because their agents stop it, and even if right. they do, they don't read it because there's ten other ones. So, so it's, time. I mean, we went through that process. It's just it's it's an incredibly agonizing process because you have no control over it. You're basically just sending letters into the universe, mm -hmm. and it can take years. 
um, unless you have some reason that actors should pay attention to you, unless you've made a movie that they've heard of. Or, um, But if you're just starting out, it's almost impossible because they don't know you from anybody. Um, and so it's a really, really, really frustrating process. The much better way, but much rarer way, is if you know someone who knows someone who knows an actor that you really like. Um, you know, getting it, that's how the whole film industry works. If you want to get an agent, finding someone that you know that knows that agent is way more likely to get you that interview mm -hmm. than if you knock on that agent's door. Yeah, it's we the all same. want to work with people yeah. we already know. Or someone you, this whole industry is based on, based on reputation. So if someone, you know, if you came to me with a recommendation, I, because we've known each other for a long time, I would take it a lot more seriously than if just some random person came to me. Right. Even if you knew them, you know, like yeah. if, uh, just you coming to me and vouching for someone makes a big difference. And that's true of actors and agents and producers and everything. So don't if, dismiss the vouch. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you vaguely know someone who went to high school with Ryan Gosling, like get them to give the script to Ryan Gosling. And with social media, it's never been easier to become the best friend. Yeah. 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 Um, that's true. Um, there has been a few times where we've reached out to people over social media and sent the movie to them. And yeah. what was the most effective? In, uh, Instagram or um, Facebook? Well, it kind of depends. I think Twitter's been really effective because Adam, my co-director, is really involved on Twitter, and so he cause he's always like tracking what people are saying and stuff. And um, like recently, he saw the head of Amazon's movie division um, talking about like what he wishes movies were, and his his like five rules of what a movie should be, and they were all what Freaks was. And so he tweeted him back like, "Are movies like that?" Like, and. Uh, got, and then got him to DM him and sent him a link to the film. So that's like an, one example of like right. stalking people on social media. Yeah. Well, yeah. people are always looking for a great story. It's not yeah. like they're going to be upset if you actually yeah. have delivered them a good story. Uh, totally. Right. I want to talk to you about co-directing and mm -hmm. co-producing. Did you guys have a, a set of rules for each, like a division of duties? No, not really. Adam and I have known each other for many, many years, for 12 years now. Um, we've been basically best friends for 12 years, um, friends for most of that, and then slowly d did a few small things together and got the projects got bigger and bigger. Um, Freaks was, we had kind of co-directed and co-written some shorts and some web series, um, which were pretty low stakes. Um, but we learned some really important lessons early on. I mean, first of all, we, I, I've had other partnerships that didn't work out. Um, and that, like, as it is in love, like the, the breakups that go really badly, you learn a lot about yourself and, <laughs> and what goes into a good partnership. And that was true of both of us. We each have had had partnerships that had fallen apart. And so we really knew what each of us sort of needed for a partnership to really be successful. And a lot of that just comes down to sort of um, the lack of ego uh, and really letting the project always be the thing that needs to be the best it can be rather than whose idea it is or who right. is in control of it or whatever. And the so we, best idea should win. Yeah. And we have learned many, many other details all along the way of how to allow our collaboration to work well. I mean, we, we both find collaborating as screenwriters way easier than as directors. Like screenwriting is such, for b both of us, is incredibly difficult and doesn't come naturally. And we, we kind of fail as screenwriters individually. And so having someone else to write with, we like hang on to that because it's so valuable. And that's sort of how Freaks began as we started writing it together. And then it was pretty obvious we were going to have to direct it together too because we both are directors. Um, but through the process of directing, it's, it's much more difficult to co-direct because you're, there's a much more screenwriting. You can just take as much time as you want, basically, and just l lounge around. But when you're directing... You we're side by side, though, with your laptops? Um, side by side, or sometimes... He lives in LA and I live in Vancouver, so sometimes we work remotely. Um, there's a program called Writer's Duet that's basically like Google Docs, but for writing. So it allows you to simultaneously write a script at the same time. Okay. Um, very powerful program. And so writing is kind of easy. The directing part... Really, the way we make that work is a huge amount of preparation beforehand, where we go over every detail we could ever imagine privately to make sure we're on the same page, which most of the time we are because we wrote it already. Oh, tell me and about then, that. Like, what, what are your yeah? Well, we shot list. Imagining? We shot list every single shot of the film together. We block every single scene together. We go over every single beat of every scene and what's the turning point and why is it important and what do we want to achieve with it. The big big thing we do is we get to set an hour before anybody. Like, usually we have to get the PAs to unlock the set before anyone's even there. We walk through every single shot and, and walk through every 
moment of what that day is going to be so that the two of us are sort of aligned as much as possible before the craziness of the right. set arrives. Because once there's a crew, they're asking you a million questions a minute. There's not a lot of time to like debate something with somebody. Um, if you do, it can bring the whole thing to a, to a grinding halt and everyone will want to point out, oh, co-directors don't agree. <laughs> and so you really have to be like on the same page. And then the main thing that we do when we're actually directing a scene is one of us um, for each scene and it alternates will basically be the voice to that scene. So one of us will be the one who blocks it and uh, speaks to the actors and the crew about what should happen while the other one sort of is the phantom of the opera kind of lurking in the background and that person will usually be at the monitors watching what's happening at the monitors while the other one is up at the camera with the camera operators and the actors um, and sort of the lurker will come and whisper things into the other d director's ear to kind of say so there's sort of one point of communication to the crew okay. um, and then lots of other small things like if one of us leaves the set for some reason to go set something else up we've learned to bef when we come back to set before doing or saying anything is to check in with the other person because often you know we'd come to set and the camera would be in the corner and i'd be like what the hell you put the camera in the corner for it's supposed to be over there and they go oh the the other director told me to put it in the corner and right. you'd realize that something had happened since since you left the room that meant that it had to be in the corner um so and then on our bigger projects now we have our own walkie channel so like that no one else can listen to so that we can basically no matter where we are we can be communicating with each other um to just so that we're always on the same page as much as possible but all of that is harder to do but the end result is so much better because you end up with a much much better film the the work is so much more well thought out and vetted and the few times that that we do disagree about something which happens it's usually because of some underlying issue that we hadn't realized. So it'll often be like, I'll be like, well, this scene, she needs to go to the window. And he'll be like, no, she needs to go to the door. Like, no, she goes to the window. What are you talking about? No, we, it was always the door. And what we've learned to do is immediately stop and say, well, why do you think that it's important that it's the window? And go, okay, well, what's an idea that would do both things? What's an idea that would you know, achieve the underlying goal of both of our ideas? And often that third idea is way better than those individual ideas because it achieves two things. And often that's because the script was broken in some way that mm. that it was left up to interpretation to be two different things. Um, How was it uh, working with an actor like Bruce Stern? Like, what does he bring to a production? And what is yeah, I mean, Bruce Stern is a powerhouse. He's been acting since he was 19, and he's, uh, you know, 82. Um, and he's been nominated for two Oscars, and uh, he's known for his improv and his which uh, Tarantino has, has coined Dernsies. Um, and actually, no, I think it was Jack Nicholson who coined a Dernsey. Dernsey. Yeah. And um, he is in incredible in that he's always, he, probably of any actor I've ever met, he's entirely in the moment. Like, in his older age now, he's starting to sort of forget words and, like, forget the lines and things because he's pretty old. But doesn't... Even if he forgets the lines, he's so entirely in the scene and in the moment, it's pretty incredible to watch. Like, And for our, um, for our little actress, Lexi, it's not often you have a movie with a seven-year-old and an 82-year-old and acting in scenes together for the whole film. Um, and she's used to like Disney where you, you know every line by heart and you say the next line with whatever right. is the next line, and whereas Bruce Dern just goes wherever Bruce Dern wants to go and, and you just hold on. Uh, and so she learned you know, to kind of, uh, riff to riff with him. And, and the stuff that they came up with together is pretty amazing. Yeah. And were you very aware that you wanted to make a film where the genre switches and turns into a hybrid genre? Yeah. Or at least evolves? Very story? much. The whole film, the, 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 the kind of principle that we started with was the idea of making a film from the perspective of a child. Uh, we yeah, haven't... The camera was low quite a bit. Yeah. The whole film in every way was sort of, you can only hear what she can hear. Every angle is from her height. The, and the genre changes as her mood changes. So at the beginning of the film, it sort of feels like a horror film because she's very scared. And then, it, then she kind of explores the outside world and it becomes almost like a Spielberg kind of f movie filled with wonder. And then she uh, starts getting feelings of bloodlust and it starts feeling a bit more like a Tarantino film. And then, you know, and then she becomes in some ways a hero and it starts feeling uh, more like a heroic kind of blockbuster. And, and so all of that was by design, so that whatever her, because we always thought this, there's been a lot of sci-fi movies, but you don't see many sci-fi movies that are really from the perspective of a child. And, and because we were writing 
with Adam's son in, in mind, um, we were seeing him as a five-year-old really start to discover the world and discover um, what is real, what isn't, what is dangerous and what isn't, and sort of learning the rules of the world was really interesting. And we thought, what if we put a kid in that situation where, because it's a sci-fi world, you don't know what the rules are, just like the kid doesn't know what the rules are. Because every time an adult watches a kid, you, you're, you're bringing your adult sensibilities to that kid. When you watch a film like Room, it relies on that. You're, you're go, you know what's going on, even though the kid doesn't. Um, same with Florida Project. You know that that mom's situation is, isn't, isn't right, yeah. even though she does, the little girl doesn't. And so we wanted to put the audience in a situation where they don't know anything the kid doesn't know, because awesome. the world could be anything. So that was the plan. And were there specific films that really inspired you for, for this? I mean, I, I saw moments, and this is just yeah. me imagining, <laughs> but your, is it Lexi, yeah. your, your actress? Uh, she looked like Drew, Drew Barrymore sure. in E.T. In, in the Wonder Scenes, yeah. but then as the bloodlust. <laughs> it's like she looks like Drew Barrymore in, in Firestar. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's definitely, Adam and I are huge genre fans. We didn't really study those films as much because we already knew them by heart, but we, we definitely looked at a lot more films like Room and Beasts of the Southern Wild and and Florida Project and weird films like Bad Boy Bubby and things that basically almost gave a Sundance tone because Adam and I weren't really our our base our general instinct isn't to be in that tone mm -hmm. so because we wanted to basically make a sci-fi movie in the tone of a Sundance film basically so we looked at all sorts of films that were much more personal family driven dramas with kids in them to, to kind of see how those work because we knew the sci-fi side of things yeah. we could bring that so we looked at we kind of dissected how those films worked and felt and tried to bring that aesthetic to sci-fi Bill, <laughs> you, you invented the shot lister app I that's true i did buy i did invent call app. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. yeah you come up with a better title but, available now uh, <laughs> uh shot lister yeah that, maybe that you can talk about your your basic indie filmmaker toolkit and you know three totally. or four things that should be in your toolkit. Number well, one. not only should we talk about Shotlister, but why don't we give a whole bunch of copies away? Absolutely. <laughs> well, so how do people win? Uh, how do they get? I'll them? tell you. What's the name of this podcast? Uh, we're calling it from story to screen. All right. So if they email from story to screen at shotlister dot com, we'll give away fifty free copies to the first fifty people that that email. Five o. Five o. That is <laughs> value. It's, uh, well, for Mac OS, it's like 30 bucks, and for iOS, it's 15 bucks. So but priceless. You must have yeah. this. And, and why? I mean, I know why, but why would Yeah, you I mean, say basically, that? it's an app I created because when I was making my first film, um, I was shocked to discover that there was no sort of standardized way of making a shot list. There was no final draft for shot lists. And when I was doing shorts, that was no big deal. But when you make a movie, you've got 1,500 shots. And if you're managing that in Excel, and printing it out on a piece of paper, it's, it's really unruly. And, Film and sets are always in flux. Things are always going wrong and changing and someone's late and you've got to change your plan on the fly. And a piece of paper is terrible for that. And so Shotlister basically allows you not only to build um, a shot list that is really, really beautiful and comprehensive and professional, but it also allows you to build um, a shooting schedule on a shot by shot and minute by minute basis, kind of like a one liner, but for shots. And so that allows you to basically um, schedule out your day like okay we're gonna start with this shot and then this shot and then we're gonna turn around and we're gonna rehearse this and then and you often you build that schedule and you realize oh man this is a 16 hour day I gotta get rid of half these shots <laughs> and then you go through and you readjust it and then when you're shooting the really cool thing of the app is that it knows what time it is it knows how much of the work you've done and it knows when the wrap time is and it knows how much work you've estimated you have left and it'll tell you you're an hour behind or you're two hours behind. There's this <laughs> yeah. relentless timeline <laughs> yeah. crushing down the yeah. screen, crushing which, your dreams. Which allows, or, or it glows green telling you you've, you're more time right now. It really, the main thing is it just visualizes what you have left to do and allows you to very quickly make changes to that as you yeah. always need to do. Which, filmmaking is about choices and yeah. it's, it's empowering your choices and reminding yeah. you the choices you've made. Well, the main thing is it tells you, okay, you've got an hour and a half left. You better get this shot, which is the most important, like, or really it helps you prioritize the most important stuff early so that at the end of the day, you're just doing inserts and, you know, the least, the, the close up of the person who isn't very good and <laughs> like all that other stuff that you don't need so that you're never ending with your most important stuff. So who's using it? We've got, you know, I think about at this point, we have about 30,000 users around the world. Um, and it's uh, all sorts of different people. We've got lots of small um, people that do corporate videos and music videos and commercials and wedding videos and that type of stuff because they don't have an AD or a whole department of people to schedule their stuff for them. 
um, but we also have um, you know big directors and and TV shows that use it, and it's very it it takes people that are comfortable working digitally, which when we first invented the app a few years ago uh, was not the case for most people, but now yeah. now people are used to using you know iPads and and phones in a, to create rather than just to you know read a book or something. Yeah, we're all checking our phones anyway. Might, yeah. Might well, <laughs> well, that's the funny thing is all the photos of me on set look like I'm just like checking Instagram, <laughs> but I'm actually using I'm actually using Shotlister. <laughs> Uh, can I ask you about the Director's Guild of Canada? Yeah. Uh, you're on the board, is that I'm right? on the board of the DGC as well as I have, I'm the chair of the Director's Caucus, which means I represent all the directors in BC. And tell me about the initiative that you successfully pitched to them. Uh, yeah, well, when I was came on board the caucus, it was basically um, at a time when um, the percentage of, of Canadian directors working in the province was at its all-time low. So um, we have a huge amount of production in BC, which has led to a huge amount of prosperity, mm. um, but not so much for the directors. <laughs> um, you know, right now about 32% um, of everything that's directed in the province is directed by a Canadian. And so 32%, okay. yeah. So um, the rest is directed by um, directors from other countries, mostly from LA coming up and directing. We're very thankful for all the work that's up here, but we're trying to kind of, um, take the amazing directors that we do have and get a bigger piece of that pie of the, of the high profile work that's actually happening in the city and doing a whole bunch of different things. The campaign's called Just Watch Us and it lives at a website called directors.ca. Um, and it's an incredible amount of different things that we're doing. One is, is just promoting and showcasing the incredible directors that we do have. But also, the tough thing about BC as a director, once you get to a certain level beyond just sort of doing small stuff, there aren't, there's basically nobody in BC that hires directors. The, because of all the work, 90% of the work comes from LA. Mm -hmm. That means 90% of the people that hire directors are in LA. So you have to go to LA to get work in Vancouver, which is what I've done for my whole career. And so we're doing a huge amount of things, um, not only promoting the directors here and training the directors here and putting them in rooms with, with the decision makers that are in, like the producers and production managers that are, that are in Vancouver, but we're also um, taking them down to LA and putting them in the rooms with all the executives at Warner Brothers, all the executives at Disney, all the executives at Facebook now, because they have several shows here. When you go to directors.ca, you'll see that it's this, it's not just a website that's like, hey, directors are great. It's um, an incredibly powerful tool for anyone who hires directors to be able, it's almost like Airbnb or, or, uh, or Google Flights, but for directors, it has tons and tons of features to, to allow you to filter down whatever it is you're looking for. So if you're looking for someone who can speak French and has an EU passport and has visual effects experience and has directed an action movie and directed a pilot, you can put in all those criteria and it shows you a director that fits all that um, so that you can hire them, hopefully. So for someone like me who's making his first feature, is, how can the Directors Guild help me? Or is, are yeah. they there for my second? Well, the Directors Guild does a lot of things for the industry in general, like they sponsor um, even the, the salon film event that we're doing today, tonight. Um, they're also huge sponsors of the Crazy Eights and, and other initiatives in, in the Vancouver Film Festival and other elements like that. Um, but one of the things that not a lot of people know is if you've had a film screen at any sort of major festival, so once your film is done, the applic um, if you've had it, basically uh, if you're a Canadian whose film is screened at a, at a major festival, you can have the application fee waived to join the DGC okay. once you've had a film. Um, and then the main benefits are not only do you get the benefit of all of the Just Watch Us campaign, um, but you also get all of your retirement and all of your health care and all of the things that as freelancers we often don't have, yeah. um, which become really important. And you get a whole community of other directors that are there to kind of learn from each other and support each other and events you get to go to. And, um, and that can be really, really powerful kind of uh, having that. But yeah, there's a certain point where the DGC um, is really for the directors that are now making a living as directors. That's what the DGC is for. It's, it's there to provide benefits and it's, and it's funded by the directors and all the different people who work in the DGC because they also represent PAs and location managers and PMs. And, um, Can but they help you crew up as well too? Yeah. Imagine yeah. they give recommendations. Yeah, it's a whole, it's, you know, it's like joining a, a group of people that are all there to help each other. Right. And we just, we also fly up like um, career coaches from LA to help teach you how to pitch and how to how to present yourself um, to an American audience, to a Canadian audience. And we also help promote the work. And we have something called the Director's Showcase, which is a three-day film festival every year that profiles some of the coolest work that both in film and TV 
um, that our members are doing and stuff. So it's a really awesome organization and, um, you know, sometimes you'll see an event you go to that says, you know, presented by the DGC and you know that's basically funded by all of the different creatives in the province. You, uh, you were recently inter uh, interviewing a filmmaker at the DGC mm -hmm. video premiere and you yeah. said something really interesting about pitching, <laughs> um, a lot of really interesting things. One thing that really stood up for me was uh, to pitch your lookbook, mm -hmm. would you call it a lookbook? Yeah. Then? But your, you know, your pitch deck. Uh, make sure that you've got really great visuals in your deck and it requires the, uh, the audiovisual room. Yeah, don't, don't do it on a laptop where you're just showing the laptop and don't print it out. The best thing to do is to play it off a laptop into one of their television screens because all these places you pitch have a boardroom somewhere with a big TV in it. And if you ask to have an AV hookup, They'll always put you in the big important boardroom instead of in the office of whoever you're meeting. And that does so many things to help you. One, you get to go in the boardroom and set up and you have and they enter your office basically. They come, your they, they, they come into you because you set it up first before they're ready and then they come into you, which also allows you to get the better seat because you always want to sit on because most of these boardrooms have a view. So you always want to sit in the seat that looks at the view so that they aren't looking at the view, so that right. they're looking at you. Yeah. And then also um, having a presentation on a television just seems more important, but also they always come into this room when their boss is in town or when they're doing big boardroom meetings with all the rest of their staff. So psychologically, this is the room where important stuff happens right. and you're in that room. You're Whereas if you go into their office, they're sitting behind their big desk and and you're immediately in a position of needing them because you're on their turf. And it, another example of this is always, when possible, is to have meetings be a coffee or a lunch instead of in their office because, again, you're not on their turf. You're now doing something that they only do with friends, with people that they enjoy. Yeah. That's where you have lunches and coffees. So and so you. right away you're in a neutral space where you are on equal level with them rather than, you know, because you're always trying to People only work with people they think they'd be lucky to work with, not people that they think those people need me. Um, yeah, you're always trying to get in the room and tap your dance shoes so that you can, you know, impress them with your personality. The biggest thing is just, and most people don't do this, which is shocking, but I have a database of basically every single person of influence, every executive, every producer, every writer, everyone I've ever had sort of an initial general meeting with. Um, and use that database to, to keep in touch with all of those people constantly. Write down everything we've ever talked about. Write down the name of their dog. Write down the name of their assistant. Write down that joke you guys had in the room about the plant outside or whatever it is. Like, um, And set it up. Um, I actually use um, software that's made for sales, that's made for people to like sell couches and vacuum cleaners because it reminds you to like follow up and where are you on the sales pitch and stuff. And most of that is just a, basically a contact management because often you meet people and you're like, yeah, yeah, cool, and then you never talk to them again. Yeah. Or you do three years from now when you have something right, but then they've forgotten about you. And a great example of this is there was, I've done this for many people, but there was this one woman I met 10 years ago, and we hit it off, and, but I kept in touch with her, and I basically took her out for lunch every year for 10 years. And I had Disney calling me, offering me a pilot to a show that ended up going for two seasons. I had never done anything television. I would never done anything with kids. And she happened to be in a room where someone was looking for me and knew me. But if, I, if she hadn't heard from me in 10 years, she probably wouldn't have suggested me. Now, that's not going to happen with every person, but you need to kind of keep in touch with a huge group of people. Sounds like a decidedly uncating approach. Seems well, you've got to, yeah, you've got to be a shark to yeah. swim with sharks. Yeah.